this is Appetite for Distortion. Try it again! And welcome to the podcast, Appetite for Distortion. My name is Brando. Episode 54. Jeez Louise. Who's Louise? I have no idea, but that's a phrase. Uh, I can't believe I've been doing over 50 of these episodes talking about GNR hours upon hours. Not just me doing it, you listening to all these episodes, some of you multiple times, and uh, some of you have been here since the beginning. I uh, just got a message just, uh, last night about uh, those of you who have just found us and are going back and listening to some of our past interviews. It's just uh, so overwhelming, and, and just it fills my heart with, with joy that I'm not just a—I'm not the only Guns N' Roses nerd out there, clearly— uh, I've learned that I'm, I'm definitely not even one of the, the upper echelon of nerdom, of GNR, based upon uh, some of you who I've crossed paths with uh, with this Guns N' Roses podcast. Um, coming up in just a few, our episode uh, is going to be featuring an interview with Roberta Freeman. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. Vocalist, uh, singer, uh, we GNR fans, we know who she is. Of course, one of the, uh, the backup vocalists touring on the User Illusion Tour and, uh, of course, featured in the November Rain video. And she's been just worked with so many great acts, uh, Elton John, Pink Floyd. Uh, I believe she has some uh, new stuff coming up with uh, Gilby Clark. She's worked with Gilby quite a, uh, a few times, and she was on Conan recently with the Pretty Reckless. But we'll talk about uh, all of that with her, you know, how she got into music, of course, the GNR stuff, what's going on now. But that's going to be happening, on, happening in, uh, in just a few minutes. But for those of you... Who have been listening? You know how we uh, we start this show. News. Yeah. Uh, no co-host today. Uh, just me. I think that's okay. But first, I want to say a thank you to uh, my last co-host, the last episode in episode 53, uh, Joe Pontello, a local New York City comedian. Uh, he's got a special out on uh, Amazon, I believe, uh, entitled "Delete Your Account." He's uh, a very funny guy. Um, and I appreciate him uh, coming on to help me interview another comedian last episode, uh, Jim Florentine. What an awesome uh, dude he was. I mean, I've been a fan of his work for quite some time, and just to talk to him about uh, that metal show and some of the old Opie and Anthony days, and of course uh, his new book, Everybody is Awful Except You. So if you haven't checked out episode 53 yet, what are you waiting for? It's very, very funny. Um, also, I got to uh, say happy birthday because I try to do this in, in real time. Yes, it's a podcast. Net. Yes, it's not uh, live, but I try to be you know, somewhat uh, current with it. So today is uh, Sunday, March 25th, which happens to be Frank Ferrar's birthday, 52nd birthday to the uh, Guns N' Roses drummer. So happy birthday, and I'm hoping to, uh, to go to. So this Wednesday, and so what date would that be? So that would be the 28th. He's having a, a birthday bash here in the city uh, with his other band, Mule Kick. Uh, a buddy of mine, Tommy London, from the, the Dirty Pearls, he puts on some shows at uh, Arlene's Groceries, these, these awesome $5 rock shows. So it's going to be, um, you know, it should be a good time. I'm hoping to make it out, but I, I, I still have a, a regular radio job to do. It's not always talking about GNR, and uh, I'm hoping to make it out. And if I do, I'll, of course, let you guys know. Um, uh, all about that. Uh, also, um, a part of Shotgun News, uh, this was brought to my attention by a few of you. Uh, this was uh, an interview on on Jimmy Fallon with another comedian, uh, Jim Jeffries. Love Jim Jeffries. Uh, I was pissed when they he, they took his show off FX, FX, and uh, but now he's he's back on Comedy Central with another show. But he was just recently on Jimmy Fallon talking about you know this this you know festival he was doing and. He was told to, you know, cut his set at a certain time because of a band. He's like, oh, fuck this band. Oh, but but the band is Guns N' Roses. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, no, I'll be out. And he jokingly made, uh, he made a joke at the end uh, about how he said, uh, you know what, maybe I'll go along. Axel's always late anyway, blah, blah, blah. And so I, I'm going to play the clip uh, now. And it picks up from him saying that, you know, he's partying backstage. He's doing all these drugs, coke, uh, mushrooms, or whatever. And then he hears that uh, Axel wants to talk to him. So I'll let uh, Jim take it from here. And I'm like, because the Guns N' Roses concert had already finished. I'd been up at this party for a while. I get taken into a room and Axel Rose is sitting on the edge of a bed. And I walk in mashed out of my head. 
And I sit down to, next to Axl Rose and he goes, hey, um, because he does that, he's still sort of that sweet child of mine thing. <laughs> <laughs> he's, right? he's sneaking in. Still cool, right? But, but he sort of, he comes out, he, and I sit next to him on the bed, and I'm trying to do that thing that you do when you're drunk and you come home and your parents ask if you're drunk, and you're like, nah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. So I sat down next to Axl Rose like this. Like, and he goes, hey, man, uh, I am... Um, not a lot of people know that I'm a comedy enthusiast. He said comedy enthusiast. Who says that? <laughs> Fantastic. I but, love this. But, it, but he's a comedy enthusiast. And he goes, he goes I, I watched your show this evening. It was, it was really great. I really enjoyed it. Um, but it's been completely overblown about how many times I showed up late for gigs. Right? He was offended by me teasing him. And I, I just became like a child. And I went... No offense meant, Mr. Rose. I'm sorry, Mr. Rose. Mr. Uh, Rose? Yeah, I, I, to be honest, there was a lot of drugs. It just could have been a red-headed girl. I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, anyway. Just, you never met Axel Rose yeah, at I, all. I don't know. <laughs> if you didn't see the entire clip of um, you with Jim Jeffries on, on Jimmy Fallon talking about Axel, you should. Uh, and, and just by the way, when Jim's talking about drugs, it's all the drugs that he is doing, not Axel. And that always seems to be the case, though, because uh, later on he explains um, how he wanted a picture with Axel, which he did get, uh, but management first told him, nah, but Axel's like, no, it's fine. And it's the same thing as we just discussed with uh, Jim Florentine when they interviewed, when they requested the Axel Rose interview. He had no idea about the interview until the night of. That's why it happened at 5 in the morning. He's like, oh, I wish you told me about it. But management was too afraid to tell him. So it's just... It's just fascinating how management sometimes seems to be a real buffer between the real Axel, the nice Axel, and then what's perceived out there in the media. And speaking of, uh, of the media, and before we get to Roberta Freeman, a uh, last part of Shotgun News, uh, this may surprise you, this thank you, but it, it doesn't to me, and I'm hoping to open up a lot of eyes to this, this person, and that would be Brett Buchanan of AlternativeNation.net. Now, I know I'm very aware of the Guns N' Roses community and, and what some of you may think of him in that publication, and he's also very aware of it also. Um, but I, I need to say thank you, and I have on the podcast before, because you know, doing 54 of these episodes, it could just be, which is fun, you know, it could be talking to this, this pool of Guns N' Roses fan, fans, great. But because of Brett, really, this podcast has gotten out there, and more people have found it. And the reason is, is because he actually spends time listening to these episodes and taking the time to transcribe in context what my guests say. And that's a big deal because he does that. And then other publications, uh, whether it be Blabbermouth or Ultimate Guitar, they take then his, his transcription. And then they, which was, of course, you know, from me. And then they guess more people find us and... And indirectly, that just helps us get bigger guests and, and gives us more entertainment, me and you, you know, talk to just cooler people like Roberta Freeman in just a few minutes. So uh, going forward, um, you know, I had a long conversation with Brett the other day, and he's going to be featuring Appetite for Distortion on AlternativeNation.net. And that's just great because he already has his fan base and it's growing. I mean, I was very impressed and very surprised. He's in, he's in his early 20s. He's been doing the... Uh, the rock journalism thing, and even some podcasting since his teens. You know, way back, he's been, you know, uh, working his ass off doing it. Um, so I, I really respect what he does. And the big thing is, though, with a lot of the gripe, I should say, with a lot of GNR fans is uh, what we call in nowadays clickbait. And and Brad is aware of it. How And, and none of it's a lie. Like, he'll put something, I, I think, the, the episode with Todd Kearns, and it's like a way to get you to click on it. You know, to read the article, and it was like slashes, bandmate reveals, and stuff. So, like well, you can just say Todd Kearns, or you can say you know the Miles Kennedy conspirators, you know, uh, member or something. But sometimes he does make it very vague. And but what I what I understand about it, because you of course you can because put like a flat uh, headline if you're like the New York Times, like it is what it is. But in today's world, which whether it's in rock politics, all people do is read the headline. And move on. The headline is not the article. So, yeah, it could be annoying. It's like, oh, what, what, what is going on? I have to click. Yeah, you got to click. You got to read the article. I mean, especially when it's about, 
you know, me. I want you to read more about it. I don't want you just to see it. I want you to spend time. Like if he spends time transcribing it, you know what? I want you to, like, oh, if you weren't aware, hey, find us, listen to the episode. So it forces you to read the actual transcription of my interviewees and possibly forces you to listen to my episode. And he put it, and, and we'll get him on in a future episode too. And he explains it like this. His bosses are essentially Mark Zuckerberg, not in, you know, indirectly, and the, the owner of Google, you know, whoever controls Google, because of the algorithm. You have to be creative nowadays. It, it just is what it is, and that's what works for him. So if he put out anything that was fake news or if he took my article and and he just spun it in a, in a negative light or made it into a lie, then I wouldn't want any part of it. But he doesn't do that. And again, he, these vague, you know, clickbait headlines, like I get it why he does it. Like I get it. That's his – that's to how he does it. But um, I appreciate what he's done for me and what we're going to continue to do together. It's going to be interesting how – uh, the Alternative Nation and uh, AFD show, uh, I, I guess, partnership continues because he's going to be helping uh, me and honestly, it indirectly helps you as well. Because the more people find out about this show, the more legitimate it gets and the bigger guests that we can get. And I'm just doing this for the love of it. And who knows what this can turn into. And, uh, you know, I, I get messages all the time of how much you appreciate it. So uh, just know that I have your best interest in mind. I do these episodes, um, you know, of course, that I want to have fun, but I want you to, to have fun listening to them. So I would never uh, partner up with anyone or do anything that would be uh, negative or misleading or anything of, of that nature. So just uh, thank you to Brett, who really just takes the time to, you know, to, um, and of course, it gives his website content. Yeah, so it's helping him out as well, but he's helping me out. That's how this works. Yeah. So let's move on to the uh, the subject, the person of interest of this uh, episode, why you're tuning in. So uh, as as promised, um, I've been looking forward to, to talking to this uh, extremely talented woman for, for so long, and I've been hearing uh, about her. For, well, actually, you know, this is the best way to set it up, Roberta. I think you would appreciate it. So just... Uh, Bear with me for this uh, 23 second clip. I think you'll you'll appreciate. to do that my entire life. <laughs> I just wanted to do that for so long. Uh, Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I've just been hearing, you know, of course, your name for so long. And then uh, November Rain is my favorite video. And that's really when I became, a, you know, a real fan of, because I'm 34. So I, I became a, a fan of the band post breakup. But I, I became more like the illusion era. That's what sucked me in. Then went back to Appetite. So I knew of GNR as this full band, which included you. So Roberta Freeman, welcome to Appetite for Distortion. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever had an intro quite like that or no? No. <laughs> only when Axel did it. Yeah. Only, only when Axel. Oh, too funny. So uh, where are you calling from right now? I'm in Grand Rapids right now. Oh, Michigan? Or, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I've never been. How is the uh, the weather there? I'll, I'll start with the small talk. How is the weather? <laughs> um, it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> cold and um the wind chill makes it really cold and when the sun goes down forget about it you know mm. so yeah it's it's uh it's definitely not la weather which is what i'm very used to now after all these years of being out there because you, know. you you reside in los angeles correct that's why you're you were saying that i do i do i love it i love the weather and that's one of the main reasons I moved out there. So, yeah, I'm, every time I, I go out into the cold weather, it's, I, you know, I, I come complete with, you know, the Uggs and the scarves <laughs> and the hats and the gloves. And I, everybody makes fun of me because, you know, I look like a five-year-old <laughs> bundled up, but I don't care. No, if anything, I would say uh, you might look like a, not like a five-year-old, but it looks like you haven't even aged, by the way, because I'm looking at, you know, the oh. rest of 
you know, especially with your recent performance on, on Conan, I'm like, she hasn't aged at all. Everybody else in Guns N' Roses have. <laughs> but it's like... What? Well, no, well, I think those guys are pretty good, you know? I didn't um, say that in a negative light, but you just look like you've you've just been uh, cryogenically frozen and you just haven't aged oh, at all. I wish. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for the compliment. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, you know, you look closely. There's someone... I remember reading one uh, on some kind of uh, GNI, GNR forum. People were asking about uh, the whereabouts of Tracy and Roberta, and some guy said, "I heard she's dead." <laughs> <laughs> and I always got such a kick out of that. <laughs> oh my God! You got the uh, the Paul McCartney treatment. Paul's dead. That's oh man. <laughs> and then somebody said something like. Uh, no, she's not dead, but she must be really ugly and old by now. And I'm That's like, wow, thank you so much, guys. So, you know, fans, fans are great, but sometimes they're, like, a little mean. So I I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I hope I've held up over the years. No, it's, it's not only, you, you know, you look great, but you're so active now. You know, when we first got in contact, you were just, uh, you were at NAM, right? And I believe I had some friends contact me and say, oh, I just met Roberta taking pictures with you. She's so sweet. Yeah. And you're, <laughs> so, and we're going to get into like your current projects. And you're, I think that's why you're in Michigan now. You're, you're about to go on tour or you are on tour? I'm on tour. I'm on tour. Um, uh, it's, I'm singing background with, with another band. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not touring on my own uh, quite yet. I'm uh, still, you know, still got to make that money, you know, but, uh, <laughs> so I'm on tour, but, um, yeah, I'm going to be working on my project this year and, um, I've, you know, I've worked on a couple of other things and, um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this, this year. I think it's going to be a good one. And we're going to get to it cause I'm excited for it as well. But, uh, we started with, you know, you moved to the, uh, LA for the warmth and I can yes. identify with you because you're also from New York, correct? Yeah. <laughs> Where in New York are you from? Because I'm a New Yorker, if you couldn't tell by my, you know, Tony Danza yeah. accent. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's funny that you said that because, you know, you, like I said, you, you're going to bring my accent out, you know. <laughs> you tell me that off your head. Yeah. I've talked to you, you know. But, uh, yeah, I was um, I was born in Manhattan okay. and, and uh, lived there the first few years of my life. And then spent my childhood in Brooklyn, and then in Co-op City, the Bronx, uh, and then um, then I moved back to Manhattan, and uh, that's where I stayed until I moved to LA. Where in uh, uh, Where in Brooklyn were you? Because I was I was my family's from there, uh, Mill Basin uh, in uh, East Flatbush. That's where I'm from. Oh, I I grew up in a really bad neighborhood. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I, I I grew up in Brooklyn in um, uh, Williamsburg. And I went to school in Greenpoint. So okay. that was like the unhappy part of my childhood. Mm. And then I moved to Co-op City. And everybody thinks, oh, the Bronx was so tough back then. But you know what? I, Co-op City was basically a city in itself. It was a self-contained uh, group of co-ops. And it had its own supermarkets, its own movie theaters, its everything. It, you know, it was just self-contained. All, you know, I went to school there and everything. And it was a really kind of like protected little community. Uh, so it was a huge change from, you know, being in, in Brooklyn where it was really scary. And my parents wanted to get us out of there. So they did. And, and I was very grateful for living in, in the Bronx, you know, until I moved back to Manhattan, which was the best. Hmm. Yeah. And, and now Greenpoint <laughs> and Williamsburg is a hipster town, USA. I know it's crazy. I was doing some work with Nick Waterhouse, and um, we did this thing called Soul Clap, which is uh, a show that had all these like old soul legends, like Irma Thomas and Maxine Brown. Like, really, it was insane. And anyway, we were staying in in um, I think it was Flatbush, and it blew my mind because it was so close to where I grew up when I was really little. And I didn't recognize anything. And I went to, like, go get some food. And there were all these expensive restaurants and stores. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. And then I haven't been since then, but I've been told 
that now Bronx is called Boho or something like that. Yeah, this it's is like so, this mm-hmm. trendy place. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> Yeah. You gotta you gotta come back. You gotta you gotta visit. I do I do visit. I do visit from time to time. When I do, I I pretty much stay in Manhattan, and it's usually for a day or two at a time because, um, you know, if I'm going through on tour, or the last time I was there for any extended period was when my mother uh, lived there, but she doesn't live there anymore. I don't have a family any uh, there anymore, and I just have a you know I have friends there, but. I just haven't been able to like spend a lot of time there, so, but I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that when it's warm. <laughs> you and me both. Yeah, yeah. I think it's supposed to get up to uh, the lower 60s. I think <laughs> finally this well, week. That's good. That's good. I mean, compared to like right now, I think it's supposed to be in the 20s or 30s where I am. So Oof. 60 sounds good. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. That's it's really sad. Uh, global warming is a uh, is is real. I think. Whether it's a conspiracy or not, something's going on. Um, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and because you alluded to it uh, as far as, like, it wasn't a good time for you back then. So if you want to gloss over it, you can just, um, like, your your upbringing, you can just tell me that. But I'm just curious because, you know, where people come from and then where they, you know, how they became so successful. Of course, you know, how someone from, uh, you know, from Brooklyn, the Bronx, New York City ended up touring the world with, with Guns N' Roses and, and when working with, you know, people like uh, Elton John and, and Jeff Beck and Queen and doing all these things. So like, like the beginning, how did that happen? Because it just makes it so tangible and so real that anybody could do it. So if I may right. ask, uh, like, what did your, you know, like, what kind of a kid were you? Were you, were you a quiet kid? Um, like, what did your parents do, if I may ask? <laughs> I wasn't quiet. No. Um, well, I, I grew up with music in the house. Um, my parents weren't professional musicians or anything, um, which may or may not have made it harder. I don't know. But um, there was always music in the house. My mother always played opera and folk and, like, you know, Joan Baez and P.C. or, you know, and she sang really beautifully and she sang opera and she whistled like a bird. It was crazy. <laughs> and my father also sang and he turned me on to the blues and jazz at a very early age. I, I was listening to Satchmo and Ella and Robert Johnson and Billie Holiday, you know, when I was a little tiny girl. And so I was always singing and it, it just it was like breathing to me. I didn't, I didn't even think twice about it. I was always singing. And my sister, who is older, turned me on to rock and roll, you know? Mm. So that's where I got my education with Bowie and Zeppelin, you know? And, and it, it it was just like a natural thing. And being in Brooklyn, it was it was rough, you know? I'm not going to lie. Um, I'm uh, multiracial, and so my mother is white. She's um, uh, Russian and Polish descent. Oh, so am I. And okay. Oh, really? Oh, cool. Yeah. So, yeah. So, anyways, she was, you know, she, she was Jewish, you know. So, Are you really? Are you, so you're yeah. Jewish? Yeah. Yeah. How did so. I not know that? Because I'm Jewish, <laughs> and I, I usually make a big deal out of that. That's the big thing. So, oh, well, I'm, I'm glad you're part of the tribe. I had no idea. Thank you. Yeah. So, so that being said, being in Brooklyn, where I was, I was in the project. So all the kids in the project were either black or Puerto Rican. And I looked Puerto Rican. So, uh, because my father was black and, uh, he also had a, a native American descent as well. So I had all these mixed cultures, you know, under my skin. And, it, and I, I didn't see anybody else except for my sister that looked like me. And, I was reminded of that every day hmm. because, you know, even though I looked Puerto Rican, the Puerto Ricans would come up to me and start speaking Spanish. And then when they realized I wasn't, I wasn't Puerto Rican, they snubbed me. And then the black kids didn't like the fact that I was so white and that I looked Puerto Rican, but I was, you know, it, it, it was a nightmare kind of, you know. Hmm. And when I went to school in Greenpoint, um, the, the kids were mostly Italian and, the fact that I was Jewish, they, they, they had a harder time with that, I think, than anything else. Mm. And so, you know, it was, it was really, um, it was a tough upbringing, not, not from my parents. They gave me a lot of love and everything and support. But I remember one kid said to me something like when they saw my parents, they said, 
those aren't your parents. And I said, yeah, they are. And they said, that's impossible. Uh, they, a, 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 a black and a white can't produce a, a kid. Oh that's God. like a dog and a cat. And I was like, really? Wow. Like, I couldn't believe the ignorance that I was surrounded by, you know? Seriously. And at a very, very, very early age, I don't want to sound like a snob, but at a very early age, I felt like I, I, I knew I didn't belong there. You know, I, I knew that I had to get away from this, this, this environment sure. and this mentality. And I knew that I had a talent and I just knew that I was, I was I was going to rise above, you know, and so that's what my goal was, and and I did it. And you know, by the time I, we we moved when I was eleven to the Bronx, kids were they were still mean, you know, they still called me names, they were they still were racist stuff, but you know what, they they were a lot better. And um, I actually had some really good friends there, and more of a support system, and I became a very confident little girl. And then a really confident teenager. So, yeah, and that's, I, I just was singing the entire time in choirs and stuff. So, yeah, it just, it just kind of never ended for me. I was constantly singing. Mm. So, so, did yeah. you find that? Because you said you started doing it like without even thinking about it, singing that is. Or, or did you ever, mm-hmm. ever, you know, when you started being teased, make that conscious decision as it, use it as like an escape when you join choir that it is, it is blocked out all the noise, kind of literally and figuratively, like with your voice. Just like I, I want to get out about the, get out about the world. I just want to sing and uh, kind of lose myself. Yeah, well, I, I yeah, I did that. I mean, I remember, you know, from a very early age, being in my room for hours and hours and hours. My father gave me a, a tape recorder when I was really little, and I would sing into it and make up songs and and just entertain myself for hours with that. Other kids. Like the Barbie dolls, not me. I like that that recorder, and you know that's how I entertain myself. And when I got older, you know, I would lock myself in my bedroom and and listen to albums and sing with the albums. And you know, I just, you know, music was always like an escape, you know. And it was also my serenity. It was it was my peace. It was it was my where I went, you know. So you're right. I did. I did uh, do that, and um, you know, there were there were times where you know I would I would be singing out in high school in the halls, and and you know people would sometimes make fun of me or whatever, and, and I just said, you know, one day you're gonna hear me. You, you're gonna pay to hear me sing. I guarantee. And and they did. You know, they did. <laughs> <laughs> That was a good thing, you know, but yeah, I mean, I was always really involved with plays and musicals and, you know, just, just, that was my life, you know, that was, it was never a question, you know. Did you, because you mentioned uh, plays and musicals, did you want to act as well uh, in addition to, or did you just want to focus Um, on singing? Yeah, well, when I was in high school, I did a lot of plays and um, I was heavily into the acting in high school, you know. And uh, I did a few commercials, and I did some plays after I graduated. Um, but I never really pursued it, you know. That was not my first love, you know. I just really kind of dived into the singing part of it. And, you know, I didn't turn acting down or anything, but I didn't really actively pursue it. You know, but it's it, it's always been an interest of mine too. I mean, well, well, I think I I've been thinking about like maybe getting an agent and and doing some some stuff. I don't know. <laughs> my my boyfriend's an actor, um, so. Uh, Would we know who he is? I don't. I mean, not to the you can say you know. Um, no, he's he. I mean, well, he was an actor. Okay. Uh, he uh, he he has a tech company now. But he did a lot of uh, voiceover and a lot of theater, um, and uh, he also did a few movies. Um, he did like George of the Jungle, <laughs> you know. Okay. But uh, <laughs> the Brendan Fraser one. But now what? The Brendan Fraser George of the Jungle. He, yeah, that that George is. Okay, movie. I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> he played the father. <laughs> oh, okay, all right, fair enough. All right. Robert. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, but I mean, he, he's very supportive and he, 
he has said that I would, he's always saying how, how dramatic I am and how great I'd be at it. But <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about that. <laughs> I mean, because you see a, a lot of uh, like actors go into into singing, like how uh, you know I mentioned um, before. I, I think I might have mentioned the intro that you were on with. They're pretty reckless, and of course, uh, Taylor Momsen went from you know acting to singing. I'm sure she did both to a degree, but she changed her focus. So you see a lot of that. Uh, so you never know if you to go from singing to. I mean, you can see both, I guess, from both ends. So yeah. it wouldn't be out of the realm of a possibility, or do, it doesn't seem like a crazy idea at all. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, I'm. I did so many videos. You, know, you have to. You have to do a little. I, I think. True. I think singing requires a lot of acting as well. You want to. Uh, emit a certain message or uh, emotion when you when you when you're singing you're not just singing words you know um, and for in order for people to to understand what you're saying and really feel it that you, you you've got to act you know and then there's those times where you know you don't sometimes you don't want to be on stage and um, you know, I, I I remember getting some really bad news right before a show, and I was devastated. And I did I really didn't want to perform, but you know, the show must go on, and you sure. have to put on that smile, and you got to do it. And 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 the, the audience doesn't know what you're going through, and they they pay to see, you know, they they they, they pay to to be entertained, and. They don't want to deal with your problem, <laughs> you know? No, I get it. So. I get it. Believe me, there are plenty of times that I have to, to talk, whether it's on a podcast or things I've done on FM radio, and I'm just like, I don't I don't want to be here today, but right. my job is to, you know, make whoever's listening escape. You know, it's they're not here to, you know, learn about my problems. I mean, yeah, maybe with the podcast now I, I can make it into the show, uh, but I, I completely uh, get what you're what you're saying. So uh, when your focus was, and it still is on singing, or I, we should go back to like when you were growing up, um, did you want to be in, in a band or did you want to just continue to do the play thing and, and you just like being a part of a choir? Did you have like a set goal in mind other than just to leave uh, the cold of, of New York? Uh, did, <laughs> yeah. What was it like? What was your, did you have like a career goal yet that, that young? Um, when I was really Super, super young. I just wanted, I you know, I just wanted to sing. Uh, but as I grew older, my goal was to sing with a band, which I did. Um, when I was like, I guess about 17, 18, right after high school, I, you know, had already been singing in bands and that's, that's what my focus was. And all of a sudden I just started doing background and getting work and getting more work. <laughs> and it was kind of crazy. Like things were just kind of falling in my lap. And, and I, I just was working a lot. I remember, you know, just hitting the, the, the Manhattan circuit and, and working a lot. And that was kind of my, my focus. You know, I just, I, once I started working with like really established artist I just thought that that's where I should be you know it felt right and I really enjoyed it and I continued I continued with that that's that's a smart and conscious decision then because there are a lot of people who would you know of course you, you know you, you, your own thing and you can focus on like hey I want to be the lead singer of a band but you notice I mean especially in New York and how hard it is to be a, a working musician to know, like, this is what I need to do, and and to be so successful at it, to to be, I guess, is it is it a proper phrase to say a backup vocalist? Because it's yeah, yeah, background backup. You know, yeah. I it, it's funny because I mean a lot of the I first started as a lead singer in in band, um, and by the time I was like nineteen, I was doing a lot of background. And most of the musicians I knew were basically the the hired guns for big 
big artist. And like, that's the kind of musician I was surrounded by. So that's, I kind of took that, that lead and, and I started doing that. Um, like I was really good friends with Sterling Campbell and, and uh, I don't know if you are uh, familiar with him, but he worked with Bowie for a really long time. And, you know, he was, he was, he was getting gigs of that caliber really quickly. And uh, we worked in a band called the Pedantic when I was 18. And that's when I met him. And, um, you know, it was a, a pretty well-known New York band. Uh, we played a lot of old places like the Peppermint Lounge and the Ritz, and and anyway, he he moved on quite rapidly. He started getting these big, huge gigs with Duran Duran, and you know, just everybody. And you know, I I started getting gigs like that too, and it just I don't know, it just seemed natural. I didn't question it, and um, it it just. It just seemed like that was the thing to do at the time, you know. And uh, at that time, you know, I'm a million years old now. But w- at that time, <laughs> um, if you say so, sure. There, <laughs> there were background singers were in demand, you know. So there was plenty of work. Uh, it was it was kind of a different animal back then, you know. Background singers now are more of a luxury, you know. Um, so. It's uh, yeah. I mean, it it just it just was some. I really enjoyed it. I really liked it. I liked the people that I was working with. And I'm gonna I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. Please. Um, I, I I'm over I'm I'm over most of it now. But at the time, I had really bad stage fright. Mm. And so to be a background singer was a great way to be on stage, to perform, to sing music that I loved singing and not have so much focus on me, you know? That makes sense. So, you know, I, I was like really petrified of performing in, in, the, fr- in, in the front of the stage. I was really petrified. So um, it was a great way to, to still live out my dream. And and do what I wanted to do, and not have so much stress, you know, put on me. So uh, I still suffer from stage fright. Hmm. I'm better with it now, but you know, when I'm singing lead, I get I get I get nervous. I get super nervous, you know. But uh, yeah, it's yeah, it was it was a great way for me to to do what I wanted to do with without freaking out every single time I walk onto the stage. I can kind of relate to that, to be honest with you. Uh, I grew up like a pretty shy kid. Uh, I mean, anyone who grew up with me, the fact that I, I do radio now is, is quite, I mean, I've been doing it for a while at this point, but at the time when I first started, it was quite surprising. And, you know, when I would start, it would just be, you know, a weekend person on uh, classic rock stations. So I would never be like the focus, but I would always be nervous. And even now doing this podcast, you know, I initially started with a, a co-host, but I kind of anchored the whole thing the entire time. And and even now, you know, to let you on a little secret, I have to be like, okay, uh, this is this is my baby. I have to control this. You know, I it's it goes how I go. And I kind of right. someone used the analogy of you remember the the, the movie Weekend at Bernie's? Vaguely, oh. I know it was a dead guy that they were. Carrying around all weekend. Yeah, <laughs> so that's kind of how I feel. Like sometimes I just feel like you know I, I'm dead and I'm just being carried around and just been operating and uh and, wow. and yeah. So sometimes I, I do feel like that. Uh, but I so I mean I in that respect, of course, I've never been on tour with the Bee Gees or did, did anything like that. Uh, <laughs> but it's so I can kind of relate to that and it just it, it shows a, a human element. I believe Slash had just said something like that recent recently. Like he still gets nervous. And I appreciate really? that. Yeah, I, I appreciate when people say that because that's that's human. That's normal. Uh, yeah. To 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 act like that. So what would you? So I guess what would you consider like your first break or like oh my god this is this is for real this is my life you know this is this is legitimate this is gonna be I, I can make a career and living out of this. Well, the first big huge thing that I ever did was Pink Floyd. 
That's <laughs> quite a big thing. Yeah, that was pretty huge, you know. And I mean, I had done little gigs, uh, but that really, you know, kind of blew my mind, especially since I would like, when I was 15, I would go to sleep listening to Dark Side of the Moon. I couldn't, I couldn't go to sleep until I listened to the whole album, hmm. you know, every single night. So um, I was a huge Pink Floyd fan and uh, I got the call it, and do you want to hear the story? It's a little long, but... It's... No, I, I would love to hear it. That's why you're here. If you're willing to share it, I would love to hear it. <laughs> okay. Well, I was, uh, you know, I was a struggling singer, so I was uh, working in a restaurant called Caramba, and I was waitressing. And uh, I had this woman come in on a regular basis. Her name was Laurel I. McBroom. And she would come in with, you know, different people. And they always looked like really, like, out of this world, really. They, they were always wearing couture clothing. And they just looked, like, important, you know. And uh, honestly, the other people in the restaurant that I worked with didn't want to wait on them because they were a little honey, you know. But I didn't mind. I liked them. And so whenever they came in, I waited on them. And... One day, Lorelai just asked me, uh, she said, you're a singer, aren't you? And I said, how did you know? She said, I could tell. Hmm. And I said, okay. She said, I'm, I'm working on an album with Nile Rodgers, and um, we need a background singer for a project that we're, we might or might not be doing. Um, why don't you come to the studio? It's right around the corner and bring a demo tape. And at the time, I had a crappy little demo tape, and uh, it was bad quality, and I was embarrassed to give it to her. She said, don't worry. If you could sing, I'll be able to hear it. It's not, it's not a problem. So I kind of thought, okay, well, I know she looks, you know, kind of badass and everything, but I don't believe her. I don't believe that she knows Nile Rogers, you know. And so when I went to the studio, I kind of half expected you know, nothing to come out of it. Or be like Nile Rogers' brother, you know, Rick <laughs> Rogers or something like, you know. Yeah, or his cousin or, you know, something. Yeah, a she cover band. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I walk up the stairs and I knock on the door and the door opens and it's not Rogers. <laughs> okay. It's like, hey, come in. I'm like, Oh my God, right? So I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> Wait, can I curse? <laughs> yes, you can. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The podcast is not regulated by the FCC. Uh, I, I, I usually just, because you, you never know if people are like okay with cursing. And you're, a, you know, not to be uh, sexist, but you're a lady. So I was just trying to be gentlemanly. So that's why I was. Oh, yeah. oh I do. I, I have a mouth like a truck driver. Oh, so. yeah. <laughs> you can uh, fuck uh, and shit, or, you know, whatever, whatever you want. Whatever, make, you're, whatever you're comfortable with. <laughs> I'm a lady that curses. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, now I open the door and I'm like, oh my God, this is real. And then I got like, I freaked out, you know, I'm like, oh my God, I, they're not going to want me. How, how, you know, why are they going to want me? You know? So I sit down, I'm talking to them and, um, you know, she listens to the, the, the demo that I gave her on a headset. So I was like, thank God she's not playing it out loud, you know? And <clears throat> she went in and talked to Niall and, and they, they come out and then Lorelai's sister was there to Zerga and we took some Polaroids and uh, we, he was going to send these pictures um, of the three of us to David Gilmore to try to sell us as a package to him. Um, for a, a movie that he wanted to shoot. And I thought, there's no way this is going to happen. You know, this is just crazy. You know, so I, it was nice meeting him. We shook hands. I didn't expect to ever hear from them again. And I get a call uh, from Lorelai saying, oh, yeah, they want us to do the, the um, momentary lapse of reason to film it and sing it live uh, for this movie that they're going to shoot. And 
I had like, I don't know, two days to to, to be in Atlanta. And I, I got I got the album and I listened to it on the plane and I learned it on the plane on the way there. And that night we were like on stage and I was pinching myself because I was 15 feet away from David and I couldn't believe it. And I was jumping out of my skin. I was so nervous. And it's so funny because when people say they, they, you know, when they look at the videos, they're like, Oh my God, you look so calm and cool and, and relaxed and, and I was just like a bundle of nerves, but you know, that was like a dream come true. And yeah, I couldn't, that was the first time that I flew as an adult. Um, it was the first, it was many firsts, you know, it, it was, it was amazing. And every single tour I've done has been downhill since then. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they always say, like, the first means something special to you, you know, whether it's a, a relationship or, you know, winning the Super Bowl or, or whatever it is. But, I mean, just look, you're, like, just going on your, your website, it's all right there, uh, the people you worked with. I mean, yeah, Pink Floyd is the, an upper echelon, but, I mean, Keith Richards, Queen, I mean, even David, you know, David Lee Roth, I love, you know, the monkeys. I mean, every, you've worked with so many, like... You are like all A list. It's like all A list people you've worked with. So you know, if it's a downhill, it's uh, I don't know. It's down a, a footstool. I don't even know. Like, I, yeah, it's it's not it's not much of a downhill. So, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, like, it was pretty amazing. You know, I I'm sure you know. I mean, you know, there was like you know sushi in the green room with champagne, and I mean, it was just. It was amazing. It was limos, and it, it was just, I was like, oh, my God, yeah, I could do this. Mm-hmm. I, I could do this, definitely. If this, Yeah, yeah, I could do this. So, yeah, there was no doubt in my mind that I wanted to continue on this path as a background singer, you know? So, I mean, like, that was the first time I ever stood in front of, I think it was 20,000 people, mm-hmm. you know, at the Omni in Atlanta. Uh, so, yeah, I mean... That was amazing, and that was like the the aha moment of yes, this is what I'm gonna do, you know. So that was pretty cool. That's uh yeah, pretty cool is uh, seems to be an understatement a little bit. <laughs> um, so unless I'm missing so because you again, I mean, I can talk to you about so many different acts that uh, you know I just be curious to to know about. But of course, this is being a a Guns N' Roses podcast. So um, tell us how that came about because you you already had clout from the get-go. You could have just had Pink Floyd on your resume and that's it. But there are several <laughs> other bands, you know, and, and artists after that, you know, before GNR, right? It wasn't like GNR was the second one. So right. uh, how did um, how did Guns N' Roses find you? I don't, was it, I don't know if management or Axel or no. how did that come about? Yeah, it was, um, it was a long time ago. So, you know, my memory is a little fuzzy, but I was on tour with Cinderella. Okay. And yeah, that anybody who knows Cinderella, you know, it's like a hair metal band, you know, and and uh, I was on a Heartbreak Station tour, and Fred Curry uh, was friends with Flash, and when the tour was winding down, he told me that Guns N' Roses was thinking about having a background singer, um, or two background singers for their upcoming tour. And uh, he said he would talk to Flash for me and get me on my gig. And he asked if I wanted to do the gig. And I said, well, sure, you know. So uh, I was told to expect a call from Flash about it, which I didn't for a little while. And I didn't think it was going to happen. It's funny because, like, I always think stuff is not going to happen. <laughs> you know? I'm the same way. You know what? That's the, uh, the Jew in us. That's what it is. <laughs> We always think exactly. the negative, so it's. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Oh, wait, before we even get to that, I'm curious, like, how aware? Because you were a big Pink Floyd fan. What was your view uh, of Guns N' Roses? So, um, you know, were you a fan? What, like, what just, just yeah? What was your impression of of Guns N' Roses before even getting an offer? My impression of Guns was. I had been seeing them a lot on TV and hearing them over, you know, the radio. And 
Welcome to the Jungle was playing on everything. And it's funny because as I was watching the Pink Floyd videos on MTV, then a Guns N' Roses video would come on, you know. And I thought that they were pretty cool. Um, I kind of compared them a little bit to Led Zeppelin because of Axel's falsetto, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wasn't like a huge fan like I was with Pink Floyd. I was like, oh, my God, this is a dream come true, you know. Um, I knew that they were really big and um i knew that it was, would be a really good opportunity you know because they were really hot at the time so i wasn't a huge fan i mean i liked their music but i wasn't like you know right i was comparing it to like like you said pink floyd i mean you were listening to it right. every single night going to bed so i guess yeah. in comparison to that okay um right. so mm-hmm. you know you know Flash was a great guitar player you know i like the band so um where was I? Let's see. Uh, oh, yeah. So we were waiting for Slash. Was, right. So I was waiting for Slash to call, and I was living in New York, and Slash called, and he, he invited me to do the gig. He said, are you available to do the big the gig, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's, my, that's my Slash impression. <laughs> that's very good. I couldn't tell. I thought he was on the phone with me. <laughs> <laughs> so... um I said, yeah, and uh, and I think I spoke to him a couple more times, and he said, well, can you get to L.A.? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I could get to L.A., and so I actually moved to L.A. I just picked up and moved to L.A. Okay. <laughs> because I knew that I was done with the, the cold, and... I just, I had a lot of friends moving to L.A. for music, and I knew it was the place to be, and I took a chance, and I was just like, I'm moving to L.A., so I did that. And so the next time I talked to him, I was already in L.A., and um, he, you know, told me that this is, you know, basically, here's, here's, did you listen to the album, Uh, just do the arrangement all the vocal arrangements because I was asking him what he, what he want done. Does Axel want to send me stuff? And, you know, the way, the way it is now, like you, you get the material and you, and you learn it. And there was, I learned the songs, but there was no, there were no arrangements and there were no, not a lot of female vocals. And, you know, there weren't a lot of background parts. And so he said, just, just do what you, you think would sound good. And, oh, yeah, we need another singer, too. Can you get another singer? <laughs> so I, I was, like, kind of freaking out because all of that was on me, you know. But I was yeah. like, okay, I'll do it. And so I got Tracy because I had worked with her in this band called Rise Robots Rise um, in yeah, New York. I, I like that name. Which is a great, great, great band. You should check them out. So, I will. Um, yeah, very cool. Uh, and... Um, then, you know, I, uh, Tracy came to L.A. once, you know, we, we started, and, and I, I did all the vocal arrangements, and we just did it, you know. We just showed up at, I think it was SIR Studio uh, in L.A., and Axel was always supposed to come to the rehearsals. It was always rumored that he was going to come, he was going to show up, he was going to show up, he never showed up. And I was... You know, the worry in me, the Jew in me, right? <laughs> I was yep. like, where's Axel? We need to work on this, you know? And, you know, I wanted to get a thumbs up for my arrangements. I knew that they sounded okay, but I wanted to make sure that he that he uh, approved them because if he, the, the longer he waited to approve them, the less time I had to prepare other arrangements. So I was nervous about him not showing up, and he never did show up to those rehearsals. And we did those, you know, we, we did, I can't remember how long we were in the studio, maybe a week, maybe two weeks, I don't know. But we get to the first show, and I still haven't even seen Axel. okay, haven't met him. Like the first show of the Illusion Tour. Right, and I... I, 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 I didn't know what to do. I, I, I talked to Doug Goldstein, who was the, the tour manager, sure. and, well, he was the manager. Don Reese was the tour manager. And I said, I need to talk to Axel. 
And I didn't know how guarded that whole uh, camp was. You know, they, they, they didn't like people to go in and talk to him. It was, you know, it's not like, you know, any other gig, like with Cinderella, if I needed to talk to Tom, I would just go into his, knock on his dressing room door and say, hey, Tom, can you talk, you know? And it was cool. But it wasn't like that. It was it was another level, and I wasn't used to that, you know? And um, I was told that I could not talk to him. And I was very persistent. And I said, look, you know, we're going to go on stage in, in a few minutes, and I need to Axel to hear what I've done and Tracy needs to come in with me we need to sing him the parts and you know that's that and so uh, Doug finally gave me the okay and we went in and Axel was so cool and so sweet and he not only did he give me an approval for everything I did but he, he was very kind and he was very complimentary he, he said that what I had done was was really good and it, it, it added so much to the sound and it's exactly what he wanted and he was just really really sweet and you know kind of you know it he gets a bum rap because you know he doing his his on stage persona you know people think he could be a jerk and everything and, and i've seen him do some jerky things but honestly personally he has never said an unkind word to me and you know, he's always been really, really nice. And um, so that was my first impression of Axel, you know. Okay. And that was the first, you know, bunch of moments spent with GNR, my impressions of them. So it was it was very, it was an interesting ride. There was never a dull moment with those guys, ever. <laughs> I can't imagine. And uh, I'll, I'll credit, because uh, we got a lot of fan questions, so I'll credit that one. She asked your first impressions of the band to, uh, to Carly. on uh, We got that on, on Facebook. Uh, and you did answer some of them. And it's funny, um, when I sent you uh, this link to our, our friends over at my GNR forum, and when I announced, you know, when you initially uh, or, uh, said yes to doing this interview, and I'm like, oh, you know, obviously you were on tour and you had all this stuff going on, um, this... I don't know his real name. It's just by his username, uh, Luda Rigan. You'll know who you are on my GNR forum. And because you're like, oh, if you have any questions, send it to me beforehand so I can give you the best answer right. possible. And so I'm like, well, I'll have my questions. I just want to know more about you. But just so you know, the fans love who you are. For example, here's this person. And it's like two pages of questions. <laughs> yeah. And, and Luda Rigan, by the way, you almost, I'm always afraid. I think you almost scared off. Uh, Roberta from doing this interview. I'm like, oh my god! I I hope she doesn't think I'm going to ask all these like damning questions. So, oh uh, yeah, I was very uh, afraid. But... Uh, some of those questions were a little overboard. <laughs> oh yeah, and and even at the end, he goes, uh, okay, I got a little crazier. I didn't uh, see the three four hours flying by. So he spent three or four hours writing questions. But no, he 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 just wanted to, like to verify if it was slashed through Cinderella who who found you and. Uh, and and yeah. then you already covered it there because um, you know you it's just interesting with because uh, he asked like because you obviously had to harmonize with Axel if you had like specific uh, rehearsal time with him and the fact that you never met him until the yeah. first show that's kind of a common thread both the uh, common threads here uh, because we interviewed Brain uh, drummer Brain the, the Chinese Democracy era and he mm -hmm. did not rehearse with Axel until that first uh, House of Blues show. Um, and yeah. Rock and Rio just didn't, and but it all worked out. And with well, I can imagine like the drummer, like the musicians, you know, doing it without Axel and Axel show Axel showing up, you know. Mm -hmm. um, even though that that's highly uncommon, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for the for the lead singer not to get together with the the background singers, that's not to have a vocal rehearsal. That's, you know, that's scary. <laughs> that's just plain, you know, rolling the dice, man, you know? <laughs> no, <laughs> you know? It, it is. No, it is. I mean, when you went in there, did you even, because at that point, like, it was what it was and you were focused on the show. Did you ever get to say, how come we never rehearsed? You know, maybe we can make this even better. Like, did that, did that even come up? No, I mean, Axel is Axel. That's the way he rolls. Fair and enough. He just didn't, he doesn't come to rehearsals. 
that's, that's, I learned that, you know, and I just, I was confident with my parts. I mean, I know that I, I came up with good parts and I, I, I know that my harmonies were tight and everything, but um, it's always really good to work out any bugs or any unforeseen problems, you know, and uh, the fact that he wasn't showing up to rehearsal, I just wanted to make sure that Tracy and I were really tight and um, it all worked out, you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, yeah. The, and the other common thread thing is, too, is just the management uh, kind of being this weird buffer between Axel yeah. and, and what his perception. I mentioned it before you came on. I had played a clip from um, – from Jimmy Fallon, uh, comedian Jim Jeffries was on there, and he told this really funny story about meeting Axel while high on mushrooms or whatever, and he wanted a picture with Axel. Management's like, no, no. And Axel's like, no, no, it's fine. Yeah, let's take a picture together. And that just seems also to be a common theme with the uh, the legend that is uh, that Axel Rose, or the legend of Axel Rose, probably. I, I should phrase it like that. Um, well, mm-hmm. big FD management. You know what Big FD stands for, right? <laughs> Say that again? You know what Big FD stands for, right? Big FD? Yeah. Big fucking deal? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, you know, they, mm, I, don't, I, don't, mm, I don't really want to talk bad about them, you know, but um, they weren't real nice to the girls. Hmm a lot of the time, you know? Well, they're not the management uh, anymore, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, you know, um, they, yeah, they, they, they were definitely the buffer between Axel and uh, the rest of the world. And um, Axel was so cool with so many things, but they made it seem like he wasn't, you know? Like, one thing in particular was that solo that I do, on um, uh, Heaven's Door, mm-hmm. right? Um, I kind of, you know, by the time the the tour was was well underway, you know, it started with a little little tiny thing, you know, because I was afraid of of, of stepping out too much because I didn't know Axel was gonna uh, approve of it, you know, and. Uh, when I started doing that little solo, it was really small, and then I kind of embellished a bit more and more and more on it. And uh, Doug took me aside one night and told me to cool it. He said, Axel's not digging it, and you need to cool it. And I was like, really? He said that? And, and Doug said, yeah. And then it was it could have been more perfect timing. Axel came out of his dressing room, and he said, oh, Lord, I just want to tell you that that bit that you do on Heaven's Door every night, man. I just I just stand on the side of the stage while you're doing that, and I I I, I just enjoy it so much. I'm really digging it. That's really cool. Just keep it up. And I was I just looked at Doug like, mm-hmm. wow. <laughs> you know, I mean, and that was kind of typical, you know. So yeah. You would think D- Doug Goldstein, being another one of the tribe, would be on your side, but I just like I'm just wondering. I mean, maybe uh, in in a future episode, uh, you know, I can get Doug on here. Just I'm just curious because I spoke to Alan Niven, the uh, the manager before him, but just like to say the complete opposite. That's not even getting the message wrong. You know, maybe sometimes the message is the, like misconstrued. You know, maybe like oh, I, Axel I'd wants. Like mm-hmm. think, I'd like to think maybe Axel said something about my performance and maybe Doug misheard. <laughs> that's a, that's a real bad miss, like the thing, the complete opposite. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know what the deal was, was with him was, but you know, whatever, you know, it, it's all water on the bridge. I don't care. You know, um, now it doesn't matter, you know, but it, I was, I was, a confident person and if I hadn't been a confident person I might have backed down from that kind of thing um, and honestly if Axel hadn't come out and said that to me I probably would have continued to do it until Axel said something to me himself Good, you know because yeah. that's the kind of person I am but um, yeah it was there were, there were some weird things but you know it was they, they didn't want us on that gig. I think 
Axel was the only one that wanted the girl, you know, mm-hmm. and everybody else was just like, we, we were kind of cramped in their style. And I kind of, I get it. Like it was a boys club kind of thing? Yeah, it was totally a boys club. But they were, you know, these hardcore, total, you know, real, the real deal rock and roll, you know. <laughs> and these chicks on the road were going to mess them up. They, you know, they didn't want, they didn't want chicks on the road they we were gonna fuck everything up for them right so <laughs> <laughs> so you know i understand that you know i i, I think they did they didn't want to be perceived as soft you know um like motley crew were, were taking girls out at the time and i just i i think that Motley Crue was perceived more as a glam band because of the girls or something i don't know hmm. i don't know Maybe it was the makeup. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> a little from column A, a little from column B, I'm sure. <laughs> but yeah, you know, we weren't, we weren't, I didn't, I didn't feel like there was a big, huge welcome mat for us, you know, because we were cramping their style, you know, and I, at the time I was upset about it, but I, I get it. I understand why they were uh, not happy to see us. You know, but I think in the end, you know, we all we all got along and, and uh, it, you know, I think they were happy with us, um, at, at least performance wise, you know. Um, right. Like the, but, the performance uh, is, the, is, is the performance, but the cramp, you know, you can't yeah. cramp the style on, on, on stage. That That is what it is. That's your job. But are they right. thinking, were you hanging out with the band after and like where you couldn't cock block them or that, were they worried about that? Like what, what was the, the atmosphere? I don't think they should have worried about that because at the time they were the biggest band in the world besides the Stones. And if a groupie wanted to get to them, they weren't, they weren't, they were, you know, kill me to get to Slash or, or Axe or whatever, you know, so I wasn't going to stop any groupie, but, um, I, you know, I don't think that even has anything to do with it. I just think that our presence, uh, it was a boy club and, you know, no girls allowed. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um, So, you know, I just felt like I had to kind of prove myself all the time, you know, that I was uh, a legit singer and, you you know, I wasn't there to be a groupie. I think maybe that's what they were afraid of, that we were going to be like groupies for mm. them, you know? Yeah, you were, uh, you know, of course. I wasn't even especially, you know, you know, a fan at the time, mm. you know? I became more of a fan afterwards, after listening to the music night after night. I was like, oh, yeah, I like this song. Oh, yeah, I like this song, too, <laughs> you know? But I wasn't ever a groupie, and I wasn't ever, like, a crazy fan or anything like that. I was just doing doing my job, you know? And... You know, so I think that's maybe what they were afraid of, that they were going to have a groupie situation on their hands with five girls. No, you, you should know. Yeah, there should have been so much more respect. I don't even want to demean, like, it just to say, if you were just a, I don't want to, like, again, I'm just using it uh, flippantly, like, just a backup dancer, or you were just part of the, like, how Motley Crue would, you know, speaking of them, would just have girls dance on stage. I can see maybe, like, right. a worry there, but you were... You were a singer. You were part of the band. You know, you were yeah. you were in Guns N' Roses for a time. So it's just, um, just disappointing how uh, some people viewed you uh, like that. Uh, but if, if Axel was so, you know, it's nice to you and complimentary to you, what were some uh, interactions with uh, some of the members, uh, other members of the band? Because I know you would go on to, to work with Gilby in the future. Oh, yeah. Gilby was fantastic. I think um, I got on with Gilby, I think, the most out of everybody in the band. Um, you know, we, we kept in contact afterwards, and and um, I went on to... It's funny, because on my website, I say that, uh, that I just worked on my sixth album with him, but I think it's the seventh album that I just Oh, did. wow, okay. So, yeah, so he, he's consistently called me over the years to, to work with him, and... And, um, yeah, it's been great. So I really loved working with him, and I liked hanging out with him, and Teddy was a blast. Mm. And I can remember many nights in the hotel lobby with Teddy playing 
the grand piano, <laughs> you know, and us jamming. And, yeah, we, we just had a lot of fun. And um, I loved Duff. Duff was so sweet. And um, it's funny. I'm just going gonna, gonna to put it on the record here. Everybody, I think a lot of people thought I was doing Duff, and I was not. <laughs> okay. okay. So, um, yeah, I just, I wanted, I wanted to uh, just make that known because people had accused me of that, and I, I didn't appreciate it because I was trying to, you know, keep it utterly, completely professional, and I had no desire to go there with any of the bands, you know. Like I said, I was, I did not want to be seen as a groupie, and I you know, I was kind of offended that anybody would think that I would make a do a groupie move like that because I was I was just trying to to do my job and be really good at doing my job and keeping focused on that and not messing around with any of that other nonsense. They were just intimidated. So. That's all it was. They were intimidated by you because you were a strong, confident, beautiful woman, and they just didn't know how to handle it. Well, I was I was definitely. I, I was definitely confident, and, you know, I was definitely not to be, uh, yeah, I, I did not want to, to be messed with, and I didn't, I didn't, I, I wasn't going to bend to intimidation, you know, so I, I, I felt like, yeah, there were, there were times where I was, I was kind of fighting to prove myself, you know, mm. but I, you know, I think I made some nice friendships on, on that, on that uh, tour as well, and, um, the guys are really nice, and I saw Slash a few years back, um, and he was really sweet to me. You know, so we, you know, we, I, I have, I have nothing really bad to say about anybody. You know, everybody was really sweet. Dizzy was really sweet. And Matt, Matt, and I got along okay. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, and, but you know, like. You know, it's kind of like a family, too. You know, you, you, you see these people day in and day out, every single day. And, you know, it's, after a while, you know, it's like hanging out with your brother. You know, <laughs> sure. Your sister. Sometimes you just don't want to deal with them, and sometimes you have a great time, you know? Oh, totally. You, have your heart, you know, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a family, you know? So, so it was fun, and I, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. It, it was an amazing experience. I mean, I got to experience a real rock and roll band. That I mean, it was in a lot of ways, it was more rock and roll than Pink Floyd ever could be. <laughs> you know? No, it, 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 yeah. I mean, Pink Floyd's uh, just—they're a different kind of band than GNR. Um, well, we know about the like the rehearsals and and not um, you know Axel not being there. But did you ever take part uh, with the other members of the band, like in a studio session? This is coming from uh, our friend Luda Rigan. I mean, he spent three, four hours asking these questions. I figured I'd ask some of the, you know, the, the PG ones. Um, did you ever were you ever invited to to record anything with them, and should, like maybe with like a writing session or just a jam? And even after that tour, did you expect anything in the future with uh, with GNR? Um. As far as writing, no. Um, as as far as jamming, uh, we did a lot of like just super like loose kind of stuff, mostly with like me and Gilby and Teddy. Um, uh, you know, like clubs or hotel lobbies or wherever we were hanging out. You know what I mean? But it it wasn't. We didn't do any studio stuff. The only the only recordings that that were done. Uh, with uh, all of us and me, um, were the live recordings like the the, uh, the what was it the Paris pay per view and the live era ninety one to whatever it was or the, the clip that I introduced you with yeah yeah stuff like that so you know there was there were a ton of live recordings and a, a lot of televised stuff like the MTV Music Awards and and you know those kind of shows. Uh, but yeah, I never like went into the studio and, and did a studio recording with them. Were and I never, I never expected to, to continue on with them. Cause I, I think that the only, like I said, the only one who really wanted the girl, uh, and the sound was Axel, you know? So it was an experiment for him. 
Sure. Yeah. yeah. No, that certainly was an experiment because a lot of, you know, they, they, they changed. It's They weren't the, the Appetite Five. It just grew into a bigger band. And again, that's what I first fell in love with, you know, November Rain. November Rain. That was, you know, that that's still to this day my, my favorite song and, and your vocals on it. And, you know, of course, the video. Uh, could you actually talk about um, the, the November Rain video shoot? Uh, it was long. <laughs> okay. Like the song? Uh, I, I, yeah. I had done a lot of videos up to then. And video shoots are usually long. It's a long day. You start early. You know, you do you. You make, there's a big fuss about the hair and the makeup and the wardrobe and blah, 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 you know. And then you sit around looking beautiful in your hair and your makeup and your wardrobe for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours waiting for your scene, you know, to shoot. And you do it a million times, and then, like, 4 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning, it's done, you know? Um, <laughs> but with that video, oh, my God, it was there was so many people involved. There was a full orchestra, and so... There was all of that to be shot, and that took forever. So forget about, I mean, the hurry up and wait part was ridiculous. We were just hanging out. It was, it, 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 I think it was over a two or three days. Uh, it, was, it was a long shoot. And um, the first day was with the orchestra, and we're on stage, and we get through that, and that was a really long day. And then the second day was the day we shot the wedding scene and that was a really long day <laughs> and i hope they got good catering at least oh uh, the catering was, was always good okay <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah so i remember uh i remember doing my own hair and makeup for that and i also brought my own wardrobe um, so was that your idea? To, and, and I'm not trying to sound like a, a complete nerd I about did, it. If I, I remember, you know, I, right, I, the pearls I, and the I, long gloves, right? It was all you? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And the wedding thing, that was my, my little suit that I was wearing, you know, trying to look conservative. Yeah. I just, I, I, I like doing that. And there were so many people getting their hair and makeup done. I just figured, let me do it. Let me just do it, you know? And... You know, I had done so many videos that I, I knew how to do that by then. So, yeah, I had fun with that. And, yeah, but it was a really long, long, long day. And I think the third day was the shot, uh, the, the wedding reception and the big party. And I opted out. I was like, guys, I'm, I, 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 I think I had something other something else planned or something. I, I don't know. I don't remember because it was such a long time ago, but it was a three day shoot, which is really, really rare for a video, you know? So I think I had like scheduled something else to do that. Day. <laughs> I don't remember, <laughs> you know, but yeah, I was just like three days shoot. I, I, I won't, I, I guess I won't show up in that scene, you know? Yeah. It's like, yeah, so, I got to go uh, clean my refrigerator that day. Well, I'd, I'd probably schedule something, like, work-wise, you know? Okay. So, yeah, but uh, whatever the case was, I, I, yeah, it was it was too long. And I wasn't, I wasn't a major player, so I didn't think I would be missed, you know? I didn't think it would be such a big deal for me not to be in that last shot, you know? And it wasn't, you know? It was just a bunch of people running, in, running around in the rain, <laughs> right? <Yeah>. So... <laughs> so it's okay. I'm okay with it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you could have gotten like a stunt double to jump on, on the table or whatever. You got, <laughs> you're prominently featured in that video forever. So you, uh, you did do what you needed to do. And that's cool that you did your own makeup and wardrobe. That was your idea to do that. That's, that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. Um, there were so many people in that little makeup trailer. It was ridiculous, you know? So it was such a wait. And I was so antsy by then with all the waiting. Mm. That I just I wanted to do something, you know. So I I primped and you know I did it myself, you know. I I went in for touch ups, you know. But I just I you know, I wanted to do it. I wanted to do something. You know? Sure, sure. 
Um, unless uh, I'm missing something, because I, I mean, we could talk about GNR forever. And again, you're, the amount of people you've worked with in your career, you know, I, I know you have a, a life to live and you have to eat and sleep at some point. So I can only keep you here for a certain amount of time. Uh, is there any like a fun story on the Illusion Tour? Anything fun, light that maybe you would uh, think that would be uh, cool for the listeners to, to hear? Or, I mean, because you've already told us enough, but before we move on to your, you know, what's going on with you currently, I just want to make sure I'm not missing you know, anything. Um, fun. I mean, there was a lot of fun every night. It was crazy, you know. Um, there were always a lot of people. and the, the after show green room was crazy. But I think my the, my my most fond memory uh, with GNR was when we played that Paris uh, show, and Lenny Kravitz was there, mm. and. Um, uh, it was it was just amazing. Uh, we hung out in this this club afterwards with Lenny, and it was a very I can't remember the name of the club, um, but it was one of those really hard to get into places, you know. And we were walked in and to the VIP section, and and Lenny was hanging out with us, and it was it was just it was really cool, you know. I had a lot of fun that night, and. Uh, yeah, sitting champagne with Lenny Kravitz. Was, was... <laughs> well, I guess one last gene. I had the 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 horn section, the nine seven six horn section. How did that name come about? Man, I, you know what? I don't exactly know how it came about, but I'm pretty sure it had to do with the fact that there were a lot of male fans, and um, they would hold banners up. Uh, saying, alluding to us as, you know, background bitches oh and, God. you know, stuff like that. Really kind of sexist stuff. And so I think Lisa, Lisa Maxwell came up with the 976 horn section. <laughs> and she's like, well, if they're going to call, if, they, if that's what they, how they're going to treat us, that's what we're going to be, you know, that, her, that was her attitude, you know. Wow, that's and awful. I really did not agree with that, and I was I was super offended by it, you know, because I was like, look, I, I'm doing my job. I'm trying to do a job here, and I have to deal with sexism every day, from the fans, from the from management, from you know, from every. Day. It's coming from all sides, and I don't appreciate having to fight for that, you know. And so, if you guys want to be called the nine seven six horn section, go at it, but. You know, Tracy and Roberta were Tracy and Roberta. However, we, you know, the I, a lot of those banners were talking about us. You know, me and Tracy. When he, when uh, when uh, I remember a couple of shows that banners were put up in front of Axel saying, you know, okay, Axel, can we fuck your background, big bitches? You know, oh and. God. I remember Axel saying something like, well, you're going to have to ask the boyfriends. <laughs> something like that. Uh, good for him, then. Uh, just, just awful. And that's why, you know, I'm just so glad that now with this whole Me Too movement, and, and I mean, it's interesting in the rock world because you probably would not have had the hair metal era without some yeah. like, sexism and oh, but yeah. it's just to, to go... Th- I, I, I can't imagine, obviously, because I've never been... You know, I've never been a sexy woman. I've never, I've never been sexually <laughs> harassed. I mean, I've, I've, you know, of course, like anti-Semitic stuff, and uh, you know, I, um, I'm uh, physically disabled. I wear like braces and a cane. I have a neurological disability. So, like, uh, you know, of course, handicap stuff. But you know, never to make uncomfortable like that, especially when you're at your job. It's just so. Yeah. It, so. Yeah. Um, hopefully, those GNR fans have. Learned those uh, their lesson since then because that's just I don't know that makes me well it's just so sweet and I nice. Think it's, 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 those you know. GNR fans have grown up. Hopefully, right? Those guys that were hi- that were holding up those banners are older now, and hopefully they've matured, you know, and they 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 see maybe that it was hurtful, you know. Hopefully, um, but honestly, I look back at it now and I'm like, well, yeah, I guess I was kind of hot. So, right. <laughs> that doesn't give them the right. Yes, but it doesn't give them the right to do that, you know. Yeah, it doesn't, and you know, it, I don't think that would that that would fly now, you know, with the whole Me Too movement. Um, and I, yeah, 
I, I, but I think I, I handled myself pretty well for, you know, being in a man's world. Because back then it was a rock and roll. It's, it's still a man's world, but I mean, it was really a man's world back then. Sure. And I, I, I think I, I stood up for myself quite a bit. You know. Sounds like it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm no mouse. You know, <laughs> so. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I learned a lot. I learned a lot, and I learned how to handle myself more like a man, you know? And, um, yeah, don't fuck with Roberta. <laughs> <laughs> that should be the name of your next album, your solo album. I love it. Yeah. Oh, that's, to- that's so good. So let's get into uh, to today, because uh, we have established you're not dead. Right. right? Uh, and you're you're not ugly as some of like, what the fuck is wrong with Guns N' Roses fans? Like some like not everybody, of course, but just like these select because it's it's human nature. It's not just GNR fans. It's, there's gonna be a, a dick no matter like what group of people that you're in. Um, I, but you're you know because I, I I was so happy to see you because I watch Conan and I'm a fan of the Pretty Reckless and of course uh you know they've they've done some uh, I think really they've opened shows for for GNR. Um, so you've done stuff with them and I be, I'm reading in your website, you can do stuff with, uh, John Baptiste, uh, from, uh, Stay Human and, uh, from the late show with, uh, Stephen Colbert, right? Yeah. Um, I recorded some stuff in LA, um, with him and Nick Waterhouse. So, um, that he was like going back and forth between LA and New York and, um, it was like really on the fly. It was over two days, you know, but, um, I'm sure that that's going to be released soon. And um, I'm all, I'm also on, I think, my fourth album with Nick. Um, and that's going to be released soon, too. Cool. So, yeah, I've been busy. And working, then in, but you said your, your website is wrong. It's going to be your seventh record with Gilby as well. Gilby, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I worked on that uh, a few months back. Too. So, yeah, and um, I'm I'm excited. This year's going to be good. I, I, I'm trying to find the time to do it all, but um, I want to work on my my project as well. And um, I have Gilby and Teddy and Tracy on board. So cool. stay tuned. Yeah, it, I think it's going to be fun. I think it's going to be fun. It's like a, a yeah. little uh, mini uh, illusion uh, reunion. Yeah. Perhaps. Mm. <laughs> yeah well i would uh please keep uh, uh me updated i would love to hear more about it and of course my listeners uh would as well um and who you want like because i i know you're you're in michigan now but who you on tour with at the moment you can of oh oh uh, i'm working with a band called brit floyd funny enough oh okay uh, yeah they uh they do a bunch of shows because i'm from long island and they constantly do shows out here yeah yeah so um, yeah, they're, they used to be with the Ozzy Floyd and they, they split and now they're Brit Floyd and they have a pretty good following. I mean, we, we do large theaters to stadiums. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a fun gig. Cool. No, I'm glad you're, 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 cause obviously Pink Floyd is, is no more and you want to keep, uh, you know, so I don't know if that was your first love, but one of your first loves, Pink Floyd. So you, the fact that you're still able to go out and sing their, uh, their music still to this I day is, is awesome. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. So, yeah. Awesome. So the best way to um, obviously fee, uh, follow you, and that's how I, I learned a lot about you, is uh, robertafreeman.com, correct? It. Yeah, that's my, and I'm uh, stay tuned because I'm going to be. There's a lot of glitches on this website that that, uh, that need to be worked on, but I'm I'm working on a new website. Okay, and that should be out um, within the month. So um, yeah, all all fresh and new website is going up. Awesome, because so. you, you have a lot of stuff going on, and I can't. I I have a hard time maintaining my my Twitter and Facebook. So a website is you know. Uh, more it's power so to you. Hard. It's so hard. I'm like, I'm really not an Instagram, Twitter kind of person. I, I'll go on Facebook, but you know, it's really hard to keep up. <laughs> and and I tried to Twitter, but it's I'm I'm really bad at it. Yeah, I was gonna ask because I know we're we're now uh, Facebook buddies. Don't worry, I won't send yeah. you any like farm requests or poke you, which I guess is still a thing. But you're okay. 
<laughs> don't nobody poke me. Like, okay, I don't like to be poked. Would you like to be poked? <laughs> I don't like being poked in real life or on Facebook. And don't send me stupid game requests. I hate that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, you got it. But but you're not on Twitter and you're not on Instagram. No, I am. Wait. I am. Oh, you are. Okay. What is your Twitter? Hmm. You don't even know it. <laughs> Yeah, right. It's I think it's just Roberta Freeman. Just you know, search for Roberta Freeman on Twitter, and I, I think the same on Instagram. Okay. Or Roberta, Roberta Freeman, Roberta S. Freeman, Roberta Freeman. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll keep a lookout for that because I was trying to to tag you when we were hyping this episode, and uh, I couldn't oh. find anything, and I didn't want to tag you on your. <laughs> You know, I, I've said this to other guests who seem not to give a crap about Facebook because Facebook's usually for friends and family and they might have yeah. a separate fan page. So I'm like, I try to be respectful until, you know, they say, hey, you know what? Friend, uh, fans can friend me on Facebook if it's okay. So I didn't want to initially do that. Right. No, so, no I'm cool. I'm cool with you, you Facebook and me. Um, I'm going, I'm actually going to uh, do a fan page on Facebook. Um, I've been. I'm just so bad at this stuff, you know, but I, 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 I really have to work on it, but yeah, I'm going to be having a, I'm going to put up a fan page. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I don't know why you didn't find me on Twitter. Cause if, I think if you look at Roberta Freeman, I should come up in the little search thing. All right. I'm going to type it right now. We got to do this in real time so we can see, uh, okay. I see. Do it, do it in real time. I know. <laughs> Even though it's a podcast. So Roberta, because it's funnier this way, right? I think. Free, yeah. <laughs> free man. Oh, you are there. I'm an idiot. Am I? Okay. Good. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Hey. Oh, okay. No. We got to get your followers up. All right. We got to get that, that, that up. But you don't, you don't have any tweets. Oh, you have a few tweets. Oh. Right. Okay. All right. Well, you retweet a lot. Okay. All right. Cool. I, uh, you know, I'm lazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Okay. Cool. I'll tweet more. I'll try. Uh, love it. All right. Because because fans, you know, the ones that don't think that you're dead, uh, or the one that thought you were dead, uh, care about you and and want to follow. And a lot of people like, want to hear about the new Kilby record. And um, you know, people were sending me the video of yes, like I saw it already, but you won Conan and all these things. So people still. Oh, that's so you know, cool. Yeah, uh, it's it's one big crazy Guns N' Roses family. That's what this podcast is about. You know, whether you're, you know, uh, Axl Rose, whether you're, you know, a background vocalist or, you know, uh, a comedian that interviewed uh, somebody uh, randomly. So any sort of six degrees of Kevin Bacon, GNR Bacon that I can connect. And we all have something in common. And see, now, because, uh, because of Guns N' Roses, now you're from, you're a New York Jew, just like me. Now we can bond. Oh. I love it. Of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's too good. It's too good. Uh, Roberta, uh, thank you so much. And wonderful. Thank you. And you asked some really good questions. I, I, I try. I mean, it's just humans connecting, and I, I feel like, you know, what kind of question would I want to be asked? I want someone to find out more about me. It's, right. you know, if we, I, just to pepper you with Guns N' Roses questions, you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, there are people who just care about that, but you know what? I think at, at the end of the day, that's going to be a boring conversation. Uh, right. The GNR stuff is just part of the conversation. That one guy, that <laughs> one guy wants to talk about GNR for like six hours straight. <laughs> yeah, and I've said a bunch of times, you know, when I started this podcast, I'm like, or it was suggested for me to do this podcast initially from my then co-host. I'm like. I don't want to talk about Guns N' Roses like every like every episode, like my favorite song and album. Like that's like why right. you know there's a, a a deeper meaning to all of this, surrounded by you know of course the the great music and the you know, the chaoticness of if that's even a word of a uh, of GNR. So uh, so yeah, yeah, no, I I appreciate that, and uh, you're of course welcome back anytime. Keep us up to date on on your record. Um, Stuff with with Gilby, especially if you're going to be working with uh, with T Teddy again and Tracy, yeah. and I also put it out there to to guess if you ever want to come back and kind of like be a co-host with me and, and interview wow. somebody with me, you know, kind of just oh, be, be creative great. with it. Yeah, uh, you're you're more than welcome uh, to do that. You know, while okay. I have this platform. Thank you, thank you, Brandon. That's awesome. Absolutely. So, uh, <laughs> just have a great show tonight. Thank you. Thanks. And stay warm. <laughs> Oh, trying. <laughs> <laughs> you take care. 
You too. Well, thank you. You got it. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. I mean, how sweet is she? It's just unbelievable. And just uh, we got a lot of information, uh, I think, from her. And it's just unfortunate how some people are treated. I shouldn't say some people. Some women are treated. And I know it's a different world uh, now, 2018. And a lot of people think that we're too hypersensitive now. When I agree to that, to certainly an extent, absolutely. There are people who are way too sensitive and get offended way too easily. But some of the stuff that she was saying that she went through, that's ridiculous. Especially when you're there to for your job. It's just, it's unbelievable. And just, uh, and they come from the childhood when she's being made fun of for her, for her you know, races, you know, because she's a, quite a mix. And uh, that she's still doing what she's doing and just shows you what kind of person that she is. And I'm just so uh, happy to to finally speak with her. Just that not as a, as a, not just as like an interviewer, but as a fan. It's just so cool. So I hope you uh, you enjoyed it as well as uh, AFD episode number 54 draws to a close. Um, again, thank you for, for listening. Uh, thank you again to uh, AlternativeNation.net, uh, Brett Buchanan, who's going to you know, put this uh, episode on uh, his website, featuring it on there. And other than that, you can, of course, uh, find us on uh, iHeartRadio, on iTunes, on Spreaker, on SoundCloud. Um, And you can always follow us, of course, on Facebook and Twitter, both at The AFD Show. So thank you so much. Oh, and as far as our future guests, I know sometimes I mentioned, uh, you know, a bunch of people, and I mentioned Roy Orbison Jr. is going to happen. Jack and Lou is going to happen. Uh, I do want to mention this, too, because it was so cool. I was getting out of the shower the other day, and I get, I'm get, i seeing this random number, this unknown number. And I'm the guy who always answers. I, I just do. I, you just never know who it's going to be, and this is why. I wrote an email to uh, Chip is Enough from Enough's Enough, um, I don't know, a month or so ago, and Chip called me. He's like, hey, it's Chip's Enough from Enough's Enough. Is it branded? <laughs> That's my terrible Chip's Enough impression. But, but yeah, he... Um, Chips Enough is going to be in a future episode. So cool. We're going to talk about uh, Hookers and Blow. We're going to talk about Adler's Appetite. And uh, it just be... Uh... Appetite for Distortion. Follow the guys on Twitter at The AFD Show and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash The AFD Show. Yeah! Thanks to the lame-ass security, I'm going home. Home. Home.